The National Action Network kicked off April 2019 by hosting a free conference available to the public at the Times Square Sheraton Hotel. The conference offered panel discussions and workshops that dealt with intersectional topics such as gun violence and mass incarceration. Many of these talks were led by prominent members of the African American community and featured the voices of distinguished panelists such as Senator Brian Benjamin, Public Advocate Jumani Williams, District Attorney Darcel Clark, and Reverend Stephen Green. Attorney and co-founder of the National Action Network, Michael Hardy, joined members of the community to moderate a panel discussion on gun violence and mass shootings across the country. The Columbine shooting, of course, was one of the first of the mass that began to uh, raise the issue of these mass shootings uh, inside the United States. Twelve people were killed, and most recently we saw the attacks in Christchurch in New Zealand, which killed a total of 50 people. Now. None of those situations involve what many of us see on a daily basis. That is the individual violence, if you will, that happens within our communities. In black and brown communities, you know, when you hear about these mass shootings, it ain't about us doing it, <laughs> for the most part. Nevertheless, on a daily basis, uh, we see crime, and shootings happen within our communities. And now the question is, what are we gonna do about that? So that's the question that I wanna throw out to the panel. I just have three letters for you. The NRA, the yeah, National yeah, Rifle yeah. Association, has a bottleneck on our federal government. Why do they have a bottleneck on our federal government? Because of who's in charge. We've got Trump in the White House, we have Republicans controlling the Senate, and for a while, the Republicans have been controlling the, uh, the, the, the House of Representatives. If we want to deal with this issue, we have got to get the right people federally in the office. Remove the money from politics, get real time, real funding, not surface funding, give the organizations measuring tools to measure what they're doing, give them capacity, and make sure that we can really help our community. It's not enough to say, I gave funding, but is it really working? How is it getting into the community? So we're gonna get those resources, get those funding, and make sure we are voting and putting people in place that's representing us in a proper way. Yeah. Until we talk about the mental trauma and access to mental health uh, clinics and resources to alleviate poverty and to uh, improve our education systems, we will continue to wonder where the expression of violence comes from. I have a community affairs unit, I have an immigrant affairs unit, and I have a, a crime victims assistance unit, all of which deal with the community. You don't even have to have a case to deal. We have um, counselors there, therapists for people to get help if they have this kind of trauma since resources are very few in the Bronx. And I'm going to be an advocate to continue to get that because I think that the mental um, health issue is something that we have to connect public health, mental health, and criminal justice all together. So that's what I'm going to be fighting for. I've been to way too many funerals of black people. That's right. I do not want to see more people shot. And so when I say these things, it's not because I want to have violent people running around the city, because we know it works and doesn't work. Things like cash bail are not supposed to be determining who is uh, a threat to society. They're simply supposed to make sure you return to jail. Well, the NYPD neighborhood police and philosophy is continuing to build upon the trust and the partnerships that we're building with the public. And at the same time, we are finding solutions to address crime and also to address the gun violence in New York City. This gun violence issue really got into the black immigrant, but particularly into the African immigrant community that does not get enough, not just the mental money, just the outreach. Um, State Senator Benjamin, we're actually at your office with Neil, who said that in Manhattan and in the Bronx, with the census, the number two language after Spanish is French. So to everyone on here, how are you making sure that you're reaching many communities within our black community? Okay. So I'm going to be very focused on making sure that we have the resources that we need, but that we need to have the right people working at the census yes. to deal with these issues. So I want to talk to that sister who made that point so that we can make sure that we have the right languages, et cetera, because I was, my point was, 
my district has been undercounted vis-a-vis the other rest of the world Manhattan, which means that my district, which is East Harlem, Central Harlem, a little piece of Upper West Side, the Upper West Side part of it was counted right, but the Central Harlem part and the East Harlem part, the undercounting means less funding for their, and less political representation. I won't get into the mechanics of that, but that has super serious consequences for us. So. I want to talk more about that, but that is a very important issue. Thank you. All right, just Nelson Mandela said, if you talk to someone in a language, they will understand it. If you talk to them in their language, it gets to their heart. So speaking to African immigrants, like um, the public advocate mentioned, he himself is, is a black immigrant, you know, in Creole for the, for the, for the Haitians, in French, in, in Auza, in Yamba, in the many languages, Arabic for, for Africans. For Africans, our um, you know uh, Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, or Afro Latinos in Spanish, Brazilians, you know, I mean, there are Black immigrants across the world due to the oppression that everybody mentioned, and so reaching out in the languages that they understand will significantly reduce gun violence. So my takeaway is, how can we do to streamline that process? You know, um, you know, what do we need to do to get city council, to get um, the state uh, uh, senate, you know, the, the assembly? How can because None of this can work without resources, which is what that was just my final take. So if you don't have resources, you cannot translate. You don't have resources, you cannot go out looking for hard to get communities like those who are immigrant. One of the things I didn't mention about the, the guns is that a lot of times if you're not documented, you probably and, and you're in communities that you need to feel protected, you will get undocumented guns. So I'm not going to go give out a gun to get the money NYPD is talking about if they're going to ask me for my ID, my address, my this. I'm not doing that. So. That was my takeaway is that resources to get into the community is critical for us as black people, but for me as, my, as an advocate for black immigrants. Dr. Vonda Seward, professor of criminal justice at Kingsborough Community College, joined Victor Pat of the National Action Network's Second Chance Committee to talk about the incarceration, rehabilitation, and recidivism of African Americans. How does the work you do contribute to ending mass incarceration and reducing recidivism nationally? You have to understand that in, in this state, in the state of New York, there right now as we speak, there are like 25,000 people who are incarcerated in um, jails uh, and county jails like Rikers Island all across the state. 67% of those people are legally innocent. And the only reason that they are behind bars right now is because of a cash bail system. What we're working toward at Just Leadership, or what have we have been working toward, and have had some recent victory in the legislature with, um, with the uh, elimination of, of cash bail right now, and it's so, um, so to speak, it's not completely eliminated. So that means that we have a lot of work to do uh, ahead of us. And, and we go to territory where many people don't go. I go to the colleges where the correctional officers' children go to. To discourage them not to be the correction officer that their father was, but if you're going to take this job, be proactive, be innovative, be creative, because you don't need a degree, a particularly a college degree, to be a New York State correction officer. You see, you don't, you, you know, we should make the requirement that you should have a degree. We should make them more professional, but we don't, and that's our fault also. But the fact of the matter remains that many of our loved ones, women, children, and men are coming home damaged because of this treatment. Mm, yes. And we have to really raise our voice yes. because it's, it's antiquated. Yes. Yes. We work especially at RAP uh, to include uh, what we call elders in the conversation. Uh, men who have received uh, or done a lengthy amount of time Right, and who may not have otherwise have a hope of even being considered for parole. Uh, what we seek to do is to include them in the conversation to at least get them the opportunity for a fair consideration. Uh, there are a few, I, I see a few faces in the room that I can personally attest to. These were older brothers who mentored me in, through, during my journey. I, I was told uh, from the beginning about, by a brother who was no longer with us uh, he survived only to come home and to pass away. My right? brother Larry Pilgrim, uh, also known as Justice, he once told me, he said, listen, the strongest man in the penitentiary is the one who stands alone. You know, write to your council people. Go to Albany, show up, and just keep passing the word. Thank you. Um, so, you ready?
So the Reentry Chronicle is a quarterly newspaper that we're putting out to really raise awareness about the needs of people impacted by the criminal justice system. The goal is to be statewide, to actually go throughout every county in New York State, identifying resources and opportunities for people that are impacted by the system. I think it's a need. It's something that we all need to figure out where the loopholes are in our system and how families can help. Uh, their loved ones that are either impacted currently or coming home, how can they be a part of the equation? But then also someone sitting inside a correctional facility that's questioning what their next step is going to be, what their life looks like. Uh, this publication kind of gives them a roadmap and to walk them through that. Many left the conference feeling empowered and ready to do something to help change the social landscape that we live in. You may help by participating in events such as the third annual Bronx 5K Marathon on April 13th and Community Hoops on April 20th. Follow MNN's youth channel for updates on your local events. Thank you for listening. Reporting from El Barrio Firehouse, I'm Seth Sarate.